So this is our next panel on the ESA and animal rights intersection. Um, we thought it would be interesting to have a panel about the ethics of the Endangered Species Act. Um, and it'll be led by Mr. Patrick Brento, who I don't think we've heard anything about today. Um, he's currently uh, the professor of my climate change course, I can say he lives up in Titan. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, any students who have not taken the course are not recommended. Um, I'd like to thank everybody who's spoken so far, and I hope you enjoy this panel. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. That's awful nice. I know. You can get a big head around here. I'm not really received the same way in other quarters. I'm, I'm giving a talk a lot with John. Here's my buddy John uh, we're both going to be talking at the Federalist Society's annual meeting uh, in November, and uh, it's going to be an homage to the late Justice Anthony Scalia. And, uh, I imagine our reception there might be slightly different. But in any case, thanks for, for being with us. Yeah, this is a this is a great panel and a cutting edge kind of uh, issue and discussion. Uh, I've, I've straddled this world a lot in my career. Um, and I'm proud to say I, I have very strong uh, colleagues and friends in, in sort of the more traditional conservation camp. Uh, I cut my teeth with Oliver Hawkins at the National Wildlife Federation, which is, um, you know, pretty much a hook and boy kind of organization. At least that's the way it was formed. It, it luckily grew up and, and became a lot more than that and um, um, learned, as Oliver Leopold did, when he watched the fear screen fire die in the eyes of the old wolf he just shot. I think, I think the, the conservation community has, has continued to evolve and understand that uh, it's not just about game management, it's not just about producing species for human consumption in one way or another, but it's, it's something much bigger than that, bigger than humans, um, and that the natural world is endlessly uh, fascinating uh, as JBS Haldane uh, once famously said, uh, ecosystems are not even more complicated than we think. Um, they're, they're more complicated than we can think. And uh, so this intersection of sort of traditional conservation of managing wildlife, uh, managing wildlife habitat, managing human uses of, of, of wildlife, uh, trying to steward the, re the, the resource so that it, it remains sustainable over time and more and more generations can enjoy it. Um, that it, it really is um, anthropocentric. Uh, and it really, as, as Zig was talking about, you know, is it all about social utility? Is it just a strictly utilitarian um, concept of some conservation? Or, or do other forms of life on the planet, particularly the ones that are, um, for which we share almost 99.9% DNA and, and, and genomes, uh, and, and we know have phenomenal intelligence. It, 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 I don't know whether, whether gorillas can, can score uh, a 500 on the LSAT, and I, I really don't care. Um, it, they're, they're endlessly fascinating in the way that they worked out their place in the world, and the way that that um, ecosystems uh, and species that, that compose ecosystems have evolved over time in all the, the very, very clever ways they have of communicating. And now, now we find out um, with a serious you know, German scientist that trees, in fact, do communicate. And, and that they do, in fact, cooperate. And, and that there's something that we might even call empathy going on out there in the forest, as well as competition uh, for resources and light and so forth. So, this panel is going to start looking at the world from the standpoint of the other life forms that we share it with. And, and what, how does the law treat the dignity and the integrity um, of other beings on the planet, and, and sentient beings and others? Um, the, the Endangered Species Act uh, it is, is not an animal rights law, per se. It's, it's maybe not even an animal welfare law, per se. There's, there's ways in which it can be used uh, to protect and, and, and respect uh, the species and the individual uh, animals uh, and plants, I suppose, uh, that are um, at the centerpiece of, of the Act's concerns with biodiversity and conservation. But I think it's important to hear from people who thought deeply about the other question, which is what, what do we owe 
these other forms of life that we share the planet with. So we've got a great panel to talk about that. My dear colleague and friend, Reed Loader, uh, Professor Loader is going to start us off, and she's been uh, here at the law school since 1989. She does teach uh, uh, professional ethics, legal profession, moral philosophy for professionals and property law. She is our our moral conscience, I can attest to that. Um, you know, when things come up in, in faculty meetings and we, uh, we aren't paying close enough attention to some of the larger questions of who we are and why we do what we do, Reed is there to help us uh, recognize that. Um, she does have a connection to Boston College. It seems like everybody does one way or another. Um, she's court for uh, Judge uh, Thomas, Magistrate Judge Thomas Smith of the U.S. District Court in Connecticut, Bridgeport. Um, obviously a member of the American Bar Association, but also the American Philosophical Association, Association of Practical and Professional Ethics. And uh, in 2006-2007, she was a fellow at the National Institute for Teaching Ethics and Professionalism. So Reed is going to start us off uh, uh, here uh, shortly. And then uh, we have uh, Monica uh, Miller. I'm sorry, I have to read this stuff. I apologize. Um, She's a staff attorney with the Non-Human Rights Project. Um, is that the project that Steve Weiss? Yeah. Right. Steve Weiss, one of the leading advocates for uh, recognition of, of uh, the, the rights of non-humans uh, and personhood for non-humans. And, and Monica has been working with Steve. Steve teaches here in, this, in our summer program, has done that for many, many years. And is really, really very well known around the world, actually, for the work that, that he and, and his colleagues are doing. Um, and she is. Uh, uh, staff attorney and legal working group leader of the Nine Human Rights Project. She also works full time as senior counsel with the uh, for the American Humanist Association. She does research and briefing on uh, historic cases in uh, seeking habeas corpus relief for captive and um, artificially uh, contained and constrained chimpanzees. Um, she continues to facilitate litigation to secure fundamental legal rights. Uh, for non-humans, non-human animals. Um, she served as lead counsel in, in a number of First Amendment cases in federal courts across the country, he successfully argued before the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, and argued over four amicus briefs in the United States Supreme Court. Maybe that's, that's almost as many as I have, maybe more. Um, so she's been featured on, on HBO uh, in, in their uh, special uh, uh, documentary on Unlocking the Cage, which I actually recommend. It's very, very well done. Uh, and uh, like we can also pr proudly claim that Monica is a graduate uh, summa cum laude magna cum oh just cum laude just cum laude. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's not so much. <laughs> no, that's she, we're, we're very proud of, of, of Monica and all of our grads. So I mean, you know, hearing uh, some of them today does does make our my my heart swell. I have to tell you, to see them doing all this good work. So Monica will, will talk us about what she's been doing, and then. Not last but not least, we'll hear from Professor David Casuto uh, from Pace University, uh, another school that's aspiring uh, to develop an environmental law program. And we're trying to help them all we can in that endeavor. Um, no, it's a terrific school, a terrific group of faculty that I've just visited recently, and, and they're getting better all the time. Uh, and their energy program is, is uh, awesome, and David's work not only here, but abroad in Brazil and many other places is, is gaining a lot of well-deserved recognition for reaching across um, borders and, and oceans to, to look for opportunities to co collaborate on conservation. Uh, he did do a stint in private practice where he did a lot of complex civil litigation, um, and uh, he's been in different law firms, um, and so he knows, he knows the world of the practice of law inside and out, and he brings all of that expertise and skill to the classroom, and I'm sure his students benefit from that. Um, he clerked for the Honorable Rosemary Barquette on the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. Uh, those jobs are hard to come by, so, so we know that he, he earned it. And, and he, he does, he publishes a, a, a all the time and uh, um, is, uh, teaches in our summer program and is, is much in demand as a speaker at conferences everywhere. So that's our panel. We're going to start with Reed, and the format is they each get seven minutes or so. Uh, for a kind of an opening statement, and then we're going to have a little uh, exchange of con questions and Q&A here with the panel. And then I guess the deal is that we're going to get questions fed to us from uh, this thing called Twitter. Uh, 
<laughs> and if Donald Trump didn't use it, I, I might be tempted to, but I'm not going to start. <laughs> so, read, go ahead. Uh, so, I'm going to be talking about some of the divisions between animal and environmental ethics and how the two fields might be able to come together. Um, so I have the vantage point of teaching both animal ethics and environmental ethics, and it really has occurred to me that the two are like trains passing in the night, and there's so much room for collaboration, not only from the advocacy standpoint, greater power and coming together, but also in some of the friction that is between the two fields. Some of it is, I think, inevitable, but I think some of it can be softened and there is room for collaboration. A great example came out of the last panel when one of the speakers was talking about reducing avian mortality in a wind project. Okay? And he mentioned that that was for the purpose of preserving as many members of the bird species as possible. But it's also a significant individual animal welfare concern. Saving the lives of individual birds who might be damaged by the uh, turbines. So I think there's a, that's a great example of how the two fields could collaborate. Um, I, I'm going to be talking about some of the biases that Hillary has told us we all have conceptual biases. And not everybody has accepted that. But I think it's true that every field has conceptual biases, and every person does. And I'm going to be talking about some of the conservation biases that have caused some of the clashes with animal rights people. OK, so conservation biology tends to think in holistic terms. And uh, it really is much more concerned about populations, species, habitats, systems, than it is about individuals. In fact, individuals are the components of those wholes. And that's appropriate for the perspective that a conservationist has. On the other hand, from an ethical standpoint, uh, the conservation biologist takes for granted that some of the individuals may suffer or die for purposes of serving those holistic concerns. Um, so those ethical implications, I think, are worth thinking about and talking about. So four examples of clashes between the Endangered Species Act, holistic Bent and an animal welfare or animal rights bent would be the use of Section 4D of the Endangered Species Act to provide enhancement of survival permits that allow hunters to import listed animals such as lions were recently listed in parts of Africa as threatened. They were listed by Fish and Wildlife Service as threatened. And these sur survival enhancement permits allow the hunters to take some of those animals, to hunt those animals and import the trophies into the United States if they can show that the country supports conservation programs. Okay, so you're sacrificing these magnificent animals for the purpose of developing conservation programs in the countries of origin. Okay, that's, that's one example. Uh, an, another very common example is culling prey animals to rebalance species, the, the balance between predator and prey. That goes on all the time, um, and that's Calling usually means killing. Um, and so that's another example of sacrificing individual animals for conservation purposes. Um, the 
another example that came out of the Deepwater Horizon spill was something that really caught my attention. And that is when biologists start saying, we shouldn't be cleansing brown pelicans who have been contaminated with oil. There's very little possibility that they'll live normal lives, and they're probably unlikely to reproduce. So we should put the resources that we're putting into this <coughs> cleansing of individual birds into other conservation purposes. And that just struck me as a glaring example of sacrificing the birds that humans have injured for the sake of conservation purposes. Okay. The one I want to focus on is reintroducing animals, specifically predators, into an area to restore the ecology of the area. Okay. So I'm going to use the 1995 reintroduction of gray wolves into Yellowstone and central Idaho, because everybody is very familiar with that, and it's viewed as this wonderful environmental success story. What I want to point out about it is not that it wasn't a wonderful ecological success story, because it clearly was, but that there was almost no attention to animal welfare in that entire planning process and throughout its implementation. Okay. That's not to say that the people who were involved didn't highly respect the animals and lament some of the harms that came to the animals. But yet, that wasn't their main concern. The harms to the animals were derivative and they were really collateral damage. In a sense. Okay, so um, the EIS, the Environmental Impact Statement, for the recovery plan into Yellowstone and Central Idaho was over 300 pages. And they considered five main alternatives and nine main impacts um, for each alternative. Not one of the impacts was the impacts on the wolves. Now I just think that's a little startling. Okay. Um, and so the Fish and Wildlife Service did include a short policy statement saying we take the welfare of individual animals seriously. And when we capture, remove, and relocate animals, we will take their welfare seriously. But there was nothing in the plan that said how Fish and Wildlife intended to do that. So in fact, there were many animal welfare issues along the way. And I'll just list a few of them. As all of you know, the wolves were removed from Canada in 1995. 31 of them were removed. They were located in densely forested areas, and they were located by helicopter flying over these wilderness areas. Um, so when a wolf was randomly spotted, it was tranquilized through darting. Um, several wolves died in that process because tranquilizing from an aerial perspective is quite dangerous for the animal and risks um, hitting the chest cavity and killing the animal. And that did happen in a few instances. Okay. Um, another mechanism for capturing animals was uh, leg hole traps and snares. Leg hole traps are notoriously uh, painful for the animals and do harm to the animal's leg and cause a great deal of pain. Um, snares sometimes strangle the animal, which did happen in a few cases. So once they located an animal, um, that animal became what was known as a Judas wolf. Okay, so that animal was then collared and 
when the animal tried to return to its pack, it was followed by the wildlife operators who were then able to locate other members of the pack. So the Judas wolf name was because the animal was the unwitting betrayer of its cohorts. The intent was to capture as many full packs as possible so that the relocated wolves would be intact as much as could be so that they would reestablish themselves more quickly. Um, however, once the wolf was captured, they underwent about a two-hour veterinary examination. And some of the animals were rejected during this process because they were either too old or disease-used for whatever reason. And those animals were then released. Okay? The animals selected, therefore, were only partial packs. Okay? Um, so nobody at, no, at any point ever considered what happened to the animals left behind. And I think that this was, of all the things I read about this project, no one even mentioned the animals left behind, taken out of their packs, left to fend for themselves, which uh, empirically has shown to be much riskier for wolves because they don't participate in the hierarchical level of protections that the pack provides. So those animals were not even studied, and no one seemed to think twice about that. Um, another issue was that the bulls that were captured were non-returnable. Okay, so it's like buying something in the store and you can't return it. Okay. No backup plans were made for the outcome of litigation. <coughs> Aging to try to stop the reintroduction project. Okay, and at one point, um, we announced that the Wyoming District Court judge ordered the wolves removed from Yellowstone once they had been re relocated. And because there were no backup plans and no return, the wolves would have been killed. Uh, the judge stayed his own order, and eventually the upper court found against that judge and reversed the order, fortunately, so the wolves did not have to be removed. But everything hung in the balance, okay? And the wolves were at the mercy of the litigation system. Okay, another thing I want to talk about here is how they were reintroduced under the Endangered Species Act, and this might seem like terrorism. So, the, okay. the, the 1982 amendments to the Endangered Species Act included Section 10J. Okay, and 10J allows the reintroduction of animals into an area where the animals are gone. Um, listed animals into an area where the animals are no longer present. Um, and those animals are deemed experimental. Okay. The label experimental allows flexibility in their treatment. They're not treated as listed animals. So the gray wolves, had they naturally returned to Yellowstone, would have had the full protections of the Endangered Species Act. But because they were reintroduced using Section 10J, there was a lot of flexibility in what could happen to them. And so the ranchers who witnessed any kind of depredations on their livestock were able to shoot the wolves that they observed um, killing their livestock. So I think this is ethically backwards. Uh, the time, so just think about companion animals for a minute. People naturally and intuitively think they have responsibility for their companion animals because they have almost full control over those animals. Their animals lack autonomy to make day-to-day -day decisions. The 
other people feed them, they walk them, they do almost everything and um, have complete control over the animal's decision making. There's a continuum, so that uh, animals in entertainment, for example, you've had a recent outcry about using animals in entertainment, particularly at big animals like elephants or aquatic animals like orca. Okay. That is because the control over those animals is inappropriate for wild creatures of those kinds. Okay. And so on that continuum, we have at the opposite end wild animals who are as free as possible from human intervention. Once you use Section 10J, however, you are exerting an extremely intrusive level of control over animals who are otherwise in the category of wild animals. And therefore, your ethical responsibilities to those animals rise rather than decrease. And therefore, the flexibility that 10J allows in shooting those animals, <coughs> animal, I think, is incongruous with this extra responsibility that the government acquires in taking so much control over those animals. And so, and I, as far as I know, um, no one really seriously considered this when 10J was enacted or how it's been implemented. Okay, so, yeah. So, um, so those are just a few of the issues that <coughs> came out of the Yellowstone Project that I think could have benefited from some dialogue. Were there people who could have contributed to that dialogue? Yes, there was um, pathologists who had specialized social carnivores, specifically canids, Mark Beckoff at um, Colorado State. There's a restoration ecologist who is very concerned about not bringing ethics into restoration ecology, John Cairns. Those two people <coughs> could have been consulted and might have introduced mitigating factors into the project that could have better taken into account animal welfare. They were. And so, um, just some suggestions about how in better integration between the two fields might have made a difference. Yep. Um, so, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do over at the Non Human Rights Project and sort of continue that discussion of the difference between the individual species, uh, or the individual animal rather, and the, uh, the entire species. Um, I should preface at the outset that really nothing that we do at the Non-Human Rights Project has anything to do with the Endangered Species Act because it's uh, animal rights related and, and the Endangered Species Act is really more about uh, protecting a species and what we're focused on is uh, the individual animal. But there are some areas where the Endangered Species Act might be more comprehensive or might be able to actually help the species that we are working in the animals that we're working for uh, at the Non-Human Rights Project. As a lot of you know, animals are what we call non-human animals because we are all animals. Uh, but non-human animals, unlike us, have no rights. Um, you could kill a non-human animal and maybe recover, uh, you know, if it was a dog, someone else's dog, there might be a statute or an ordinance that allows you to recover uh, the value of that animal as an owner. But the animal itself has no legal rights. And so what we're trying to do at the Non-Human Rights Project is fill that gap in the law to the extent that the non-human animal is autonomous and intelligent and at least within, within uh, its own species is autonomous. Um, beings that for, for all practical purposes um, should be entitled to have certain legal rights, at least with respect to autonomy and to liberty, uh, should not be allowed to be confined in artificial, you know, confined spaces. Um, and the example I'm going to give you is Tommy the chimpanzee, who was our first plaintiff in the non-human rights project lawsuit. Uh, it was a habeas corpus case that we brought in New York State uh, two years ago now, uh, although we are still litigating his case as well as uh, two other sets of chimpanzees. Um, Tommy grew up in a confined uh, cage in a cement uh, 
kind of garage like shed building um, alone as a solitary, you know, there's chickens and there's social species, but, but he was kept in a solitary uh, confinement. Um, his owner claimed that he was fine because he had television, like cable television, um, that he could watch whenever he wanted. It was color, color TV, so that was, I guess, enough for, for the owner to say that that was fine. And unfortunately, everything that the owner was doing with Tommy was perfectly legal under our statutes and under the Endangered Species Act. Now, up until recently, uh, chimpanzees, although they're listed as endangered species, have only been listed to the extent that they were uh, in the wild. So captive chimpanzees have been allowed to be sold and, and uh, owned, and, and like in Tommy's case, you know, put in a cement crate uh, by himself for many, many, many years. Um, now, I think as of 2015, um, I think now captive chimpanzees are alike treated as, uh, or listed as endangered species listed. Um, however, there are many caveats to that, including the fact that they can still be exhibited, traded, uh, moved across state. I think if they're moved across state lines, there might be uh, more provisions there, but they just can't be sold uh, so long as they were lawfully acquired in the first place. So again, a chimpanzee like Tommy um, is still not protected. So what, what we had in New York is, is we filed a, a lawsuit seeking habeas corpus, meaning liberate the body. And this is an ancient writ that's been used um, for centuries, uh, including on behalf of slaves, black slaves, who were at one time not considered persons either. They too had no legal rights. And the writ of habeas corpus was used in England and eventually in the States to release the body, to require a court to look and say, is this um, being capable you know, of having legal personhood? Can this thing become a legal person? And through habeas corpus, in the famous Somerset case in England, the answer was yes by George uh, Judge Mansfield said, yes, uh, this, this thing, this legal thing, is now a person. And so we're trying to use that remedy in the Non-Human Rights Project to transfer what is considered a legal thing into person for certain rights, not for everything. We don't think that chimpanzees probably should have a First Amendment right to vote. But we do think that chimpanzees should have a right to exercise bodily liberty and autonomy uh, and meaning they should not be confined in cement uh, cages and be living by themselves in solitary confinement. Since we filed Tommy's case two years ago, um, as of right now, we don't know where Tommy is, and frankly, we don't know if Tommy is even alive. We have uh, reached out to you know, the federal government, we've reached out to um, some people on the inside that we know he was maybe moved to Michigan, but the federal government has no records of this, and I don't believe they're even obligated to. So whether or not that's um, you know, something that the ESA should cover or something else, we think that at the very least, as a protected species, the, the government should have some idea of where the, the individual animals are and how they're being treated as well. I don't know, again, if that's really within the scope of the ESA, but it certainly reflects a, a um, gap in the law as far as, as um, where you know, cap captive chimpanzees lie, whether there should even be allowed to be captive chimpanzees under the Endangered Species Act, which currently, even as protected species, they're still allowed to be you know, detained and so forth. Um, so we are still continuing our case on behalf of Tommy as well as Kiko and Hercules and Leo, who had been moved to Louisiana. We are still trying to get them moved to a sanctuary in Florida that respects their autonomy, treats them as though they are living beings and not as property. Um, so I guess that pretty much wraps up my comments. Um, thank you, Mark. David? Okay, well, thank you. This, uh, I, I feel like what I have to say is, is, is does kind of help maybe sum up the two points of view we've seen. And also, I have a, a uh, I guess, sort of a unique um, position with respect to animal law and environmental law in the sense that I do teach both and I think they're kind of the same thing and or there are different ways of looking at the same thing. And also, for example, I mean, I, I mooted Steve Wise for his, his court case of, uh, uh, about Tommy and I've drunk lots of beer with Pat Parento. <laughs> So, so I, I feel like you know I feel like the connections are, are, are clear and obvious and and the the uh, the thing I wanted to talk about a little bit also is even just today my, my perspective has changed some because recently I, I I've done a lot of uh, well I was just at the IUCN World Conservation Congress um, which 
uh, IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, is the world's largest NGO, and nobody's ever heard of it. Uh, it, it is, uh, countries belong to it. it, it kind of acts as a United Nations for Environmental Policy, and um, CITES, for example, came out of uh, the IUCN. CITES is the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, and uh, the Endangered Species Act was enacted in order to implement CITES. And of course, it went further than that in, in all kinds of ways. But the, um, the thing, the reason I was at IUCN was because I was there to appeal a decision by the IUCN to reject the application of, and here's my prop, uh, <laughs> reject the application of the Animal Legal Defense Fund uh, for membership in the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. ALDF was rejected, ostensibly because a group, a band of trophy hunting or organizations, uh, of which there are many that belong to IUCN, banded together to oppose IUCN's application as they have opposed uh, the application of every animal advocacy organization that has ever applied to IUCN successfully. They have uh, the International Fund for Animal Welfare, IFA, also uh, rejected, although they are doing it again. We'll see if they have better luck. In any case, um, the, the, uh, from, from IUCN, maybe a week and a half later, I went to CITES in, in South Africa as ALDF's observer. So ALDF apparently has enough credibility with the governments of the world, signatories to this treaty, to give them observer status because ALDF is, of course, concerned with uh, species as well as individuals, but cannot yet be a member of the IUCN for all kinds of political reasons. And that's the thing, you know, the politics are very interesting. And politics and animals and environment are, of course, interwoven in ways that you, uh, Isaac, uh, articulated far more, uh, far better than I ever could. Um, so, but, but the, the, the this is still going on. For example, when I was at CITES, I was at the plenary session, and the, uh, the representative of Zimbabwe um, asked that the language, they were discussing uh, language of a, a resolution regarding animals in the trade in ivory, which is, is a huge issue, uh, which maybe we can talk about during the Q&A. Um, the representative from Zimbabwe asked that the language changed because he objected to the term harvest when used to uh, for elephant trophy hunting. He said that the term demeans trophy hunting. <laughs> and so I, I, just, I had to stop <laughs> and I had to just make sure I heard correctly because first of all, harvest is a term that was invented by trophy hunters. They like to use the term because the other terms like slaughter, murder, you know, that kind of stuff. It doesn't go over well, so they invented the term harvest, and now even that offends them. So, unlike Pat, I did not, I, I don't tweet often. <laughs> I'm not a tweeter, but I tweeted. I, 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 said, I said in my tweet that Zimbabwe objects to the term harvest as demeaning to trophy hunters, and I object to the term trophy hunting as demeaning to trophies. <laughs> so, so anyway, what does all this have, have to do with animal love? Well, um, it has a lot to do. It, it highlights the tensions, as we heard uh, we talk about as well, uh, between animal law and environmental, because of the idea of the species versus the individual. And even, you know, even the term uh, canary in the coal mine, which which Zig used because it's a very common and useful term to talk about, you know, using how you determine dangers to to people. But what about that canary in the coal mine? What what you know, an animal lawyer would talk about that canary. And that canary is a member of a species, sure, but what would be an animal law perspective on the Endangered Species Act and CITES, which have things like incidental take? You know, what does that mean, incidental take? Do we use that term when we talk about what's going on in Aleppo? No, we talk about collateral damage. 
we talk about senseless slaughter. But incidental take is used because it actually you're giving people permits to kill. So, you know, that is right there highlights a very important distinction between an animal-oriented perspective to a statute, which is, of course, very important to animals. Don't get me wrong. I teach the Endangered Species Act, and I think it's absolutely crucial. But there are aspects of it that must be looked at critically, socio-culturally critically, in order to understand that there are there is more to this than just a species-oriented approach. And then, you know, because species are made up of individuals. That's the thing that I think is, you know, an important tie-in between animal law and environmental law. And the last thing I'll say is I was teaching CITES. I teach environmental law at Williams College, among other places. And, and I, I was teaching CITES from CITES to my students at, uh, at Williams. And I was, you know, giving them a negotiation exercise. And we used the bluefin tuna, which is a great example of, a, of, of an animal with a great deal of cultural significance and that people just love to eat. And I asked them to, you know, bluefin tuna was asked to be listed, was, li well, was proposed to be listed at the previous conference of the parties at CITES. And there was a huge political to-do about it. But I gave it to my students as a, as a, I made them represent different countries. And they ultimately determined that it should be listed on Appendix 2, which allows trade. And so the question, I guess, I would just end with is, you know, that seems like a pretty good result for an environmental law class, because it accounts for the fact that demand will may not change despite, despite what we would like, or we may not. But from an animal law perspective, did I screw up? Thanks. <laughs> What's the time check here? How are we doing? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Well, let me just pose one question to the panel and then we'll take some other questions. Okay, here's your scenario. Hillary Clinton is president. Eric Garland's on the Supreme Court. The Republican, uh, Democrats have taken back the Senate. Uh, Bernie is chair of the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee. <laughs> <laughs> and he's turned to you, he's called all three of you personally. He said, I want to amend the Endangered Species Act to do a better job of integrating animal law and conservation law. What are your three recommendations? I mean, this is sort of just dovetailing uh, what you know we've talked about today, but I think that the idea of the take, the license to kill, I think would definitely need to be reevaluated. Um, you know, independent of, of anything else. Because, like, again, in Tommy's case, the fact that Tommy is, even even though it's not maybe a taking because Tommy's still alive, I think the idea that a, a chimpanzee, a, a being that is so similar to us, is allowed to be kept in a confined, basically a jail cell, uh, for doing nothing wrong um, just because he's a chimpanzee, I think is, is fundamentally <coughs> problematic. And if you just don't look at the individual animal that makes up the species, I think that just, I don't know, that, that, that does a harm. So I would include something about animal welfare in the act itself uh, to make sure that that's at least considered um, in any kind of recovery project. And I would make that mandatory. Mandatory. I, I, would, I would look at, um, I, I think it's absolutely true as, as we've discussed that politics is inevitably linked to the endangered species <laughs> listings. But there's a lot more science that could be uh, could be brought to bear, and in that science could acknowledge the fact that there are, for example, species that are on their way to being extinct, not because their numbers are so small, but because of all sorts of other factors. We need to be a little bit more proactive and maybe stop species from becoming endangered. Here are actually some better questions. Uh, how do incidences of wildlife trafficking, such as, such as the poaching, of African elephants pertain to animal rights law and the ESA, how can the two sectors of law meet together to address issues like wildlife trafficking? So you might want to start. I love questions that I've actually thought about. So, so with respect to ivory trafficking, this is an interesting question because the politics are so clear. First of all, it's amazing 
it would be amazing to consider how powerful the trophy hunting lobby is, internationally speaking, if we didn't have our own experience with, for example, the NRA, which has such untoward power, despite the fact that the numbers are small. So with respect to, with respect to elephant trafficking, the, 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 re the problem is that there is pretty much a global consensus that, that trade in ivory is bad, killing elephants is bad as a general matter, although there are subtleties there that we, we, we could certainly talk about at length. But the, uh, the trade in ivory is very lucrative to the, both the nations where the elephants live, many of the nations that the elephants live in, and to the markets where the ivory is traded to. And so twice in the last 15 years, there was a legal ivory that was poured into the market. And what that did was that it, it caused demand to surge. And now there's a huge demand for ivory. And so what could be done about that? What could be done about that is we could stop doing stupid stuff like allowing, <laughs> allowing you know, legal trade in ivory, because that was a huge problem at this past sightings. And the, the now elephant, you know, the, the protections for elephants, the listing for elephants, the trade in ivory was basically abrogated because of this because of this silly idea that it was okay to traffic in this so-called legal ivory. I have nothing to add. I would do away with the Section 4D's um, enhancement of survival permits for, for example, the uh, the lions listed as threatened in eastern and uh, I believe this southern Africa. Um, and I just don't think they should be allowed at all. There's several on this theme, so let's stick with it because I think people are interested. Are, are there any tensions between ESA protections, animal welfare, and local native communities? <coughs> practices and um, arguably food sources. There are probably other animal issues that um, will come up in the future, especially as coastlines finish with climate change and people are moved around um, and animals are moved around. So I'm trying to think of specific cases. None are coming to me right now, but I think that we can expect those uh, conflicts to arise even more frequently. I think we do see a lot of these types of conflicts with respect to uh, cultural practices and traditional uses of animals, which are, you know, each one of them is worthy of discussion. It's, it's one of these things where the, you know, it, it's, as we like to say in the law, you know, it's a fact-specific analysis. But the, the reality is that, you know, cultural traditions if, if we were weighing cultural traditions against life, this animal lives, the same way we weigh cultural traditions against human lives, there would be no, there would be no discussion. And so that, I think, should be the starting point. I'm not necessarily saying it's the end point, but it should be the starting point for any sort of discussion about these things. Yes, it's absolutely, it's absolutely crucial that cultural traditions and, and heritage be, be respected. And at the same time, when animals are dying in horrible agony as a result of those cultural traditions, then we have to think about that. We should think about that because it's not, it's, it's not irrelevant. Would you ban subsistence whaling? Would I ban subsistence whaling? Uh, so the term, the important term in there is subsistence. And so the basic, the, the, the part of subsistence means you need it to survive. And if it's absolutely true that you need something to survive, then that would, be, that would fall under the category of legal necessity. And I think legal necessity is a very important term. It's the same thing, the same reason we, we, we allow people to kill in self-defense. If you need to do something to survive, then you should do it. You know? But if you don't need to do it to survive, then you should. Well, they could eat a burger king. <laughs> well, then, I don't know that that's a solution, Pat. <laughs> too much more to add to that, but I, I do think that like when you look at other intersections of the law, like the First Amendment, and when cultural traditions
arguments are pitted against, um, you know, when, when they claim a religious right and it's pitted against a neutral law such as, um, you know, like what, you see it with the animal slaughter case, but uh, the Peyote case in um, Smith, Smith versus Born, but the case where, you know, um, no, you can't just smoke peyote whenever you want. Um, you know, like employers can have regulations on that. So I think you can also pull from other areas of the law when it comes to cultural traditions, and it's not just a license to, um, you know, cause harm or to, um, you know. I, and I think, yeah, that's just that. Well, this is similar but I think this is a huge issue in Africa with African wildlife and so-called sustainable approaches to wildlife management, right? Should countries have autonomy to do uh, in what they do with their own animals? If not, what is the way do other countries have to interfere? So specifically, when Namibia says we're going to auction off the old rhino's head for $50,000 and we're going to use that money to hire 10 new wardens to prevent rhino poaching throughout Namibia, should Namibia be able to do that or should we be able to tell them no? I mean, I think that, I don't know if it's our place to tell the movie what to do, period. I don't know about that. But um, as far as, you know, weighing one rhino against ten, I think, again, if you sort of substitute human beings in that scenario, um, would we allow one human being to suffer for the ten? I don't, I don't know if we would tolerate that type of discussion. So I think my solution would be trying to find a different solution to both of those problems. Um, yeah, I also would just note that, you know, in, in, embedded in the question is, should we tell them, I don't know who we is, uh, should the United States be the world's policeman? That's an interesting question. <laughs> uh, but but, but whether, whether or not we as a world community like, for, uh, should, should have something to say to that, that, you know, well, that's what CITES is. And that's why we have an Endangered Species Act. And I think that it is indeed a useful tool through which to express our disapproval of certain practices. I agree with Monica here that looking for alternatives that satisfy the same purposes that we might have would be the best way to go. If they are seeking money to do some worthy conservation practices, then that would be the avenue that I think should be explored rather than uh, supporting the bidding over animals. And so uh, I think that to the extent that we could use persuasion and assistance would be the best. So here's a perennial, I think. Uh, and do zoos, aquariums, and even game farms have a role to play in rehabilitation? Do they now? Well, that's a big um, Maybe claim. Maybe should they? Maybe they, should they put them. Okay, well, the claim they make that they do is really not empirically well documented. Very little of their money does go for those purposes. Very little of the, their activities do engage in those purposes. Should they? I don't know. Uh, there's a problem inherently with breeding wild animals in captivity. And I would rather not see that happen. Um, uh, the federal government seems to have abandoned its Red Wolf Recovery Project and is looking to the captive uh, breeding of red wolves as an alternative. And I, that makes me very uncomfortable. Yeah, I tend to agree here. I mean, I don't see very many situations where there's a genuine um, rehabilitation, uh, cap, you know, captive breeding scenario where the animals are. Um, <coughs> I mean, this is again another area where the, where the species versus the individual animal, because a lot of times those animals are just exhibited, and if you if it's a zoo, they might have a very small confinement. Yes, it might be in the name of. Uh, you know, rehabilitating the species and having more. I mean, I think SeaWorld was using that excuse for a long time. Um, and so I think so many, so many bad things can be done in the name of uh, rehabilitation and reintroducing species that there's just, um, I think that the ability for that abuse is just too far, far vast. And we've seen so many instances of it being abused that I can't, I can't justify, you know, that approach. 
Well, without disagreeing with anything that, that was just said, I would say that again, and this is pretty recent experience for me, my, my, my experience now with the lobbying uh, on behalf of the ALDF, etc., for, for, for help with the IUCN, and recently at, at CITES, I, they, they, there is, I mean, the uh, zoo community, for example, is very supportive of, of the International Fund for Animal Welfare's application for membership to IUCN. And there is a certain amount, you know, and, and there's, there's more that I can say about that, but, we're, but, but I'll just say that the, the real politic of aspect of these, of these issues is increasingly, it makes me increasingly dubious of taking any kind of, of, of <coughs> straight line position on, on any of these issues. And, and that's, that's, that's where I stand right now. I'm just trying to find the best way forward, and I don't know what it is. Wow, how refreshingly. <laughs> so we're going to close with a rhetorical question. Don't you animal rights advocates regard Zig Plotter as a soulless utilitarian when it comes to wildlife? <laughs> <laughs> we're all done. Thank you very much.